Hello everyone and welcome to the next segment of Real History in which we are analyzing the 1993 epic Gettysburg. As I said at the introduction of our previous segment, this is a movie that is near and dear to my heart. It is uh, the film that by and large inspired me to become a, a historian and the same is true for uh, many of my colleagues around my age as well. Um, but certainly that does not absolve it completely of uh, some of its inaccuracies and liberties. And so uh, as we continue to take a look at Gettysburg, we are going to continue separating fact from fiction. Where we are going to pick up is on the morning of July 2nd, 1863. The hook starts there. Now it curves round and comes down this low ridge to the south ending before two round hills of higher elevation. This is kind of the iconic formation that is often associated with the Battle of Gettysburg, the so-called fishhook defense for the Union defenders that uh, stretches from Culpsthill through Cemetery Hill down Cemetery Ridge to Little Round Top and Big Round Top. And it will be on both the left and right anchors of this so-called fish hook or candy cane or whatever you want to call it on July 2nd where Robert E. Lee will strike. I think the best way to sum it up is that Lee is going for a double punch against the Union defenses. Uh, previously at the Battle of Chancellorsville only two months prior uh, he and General Stonewall Jackson had uh, exploited uh, the Union Army's position by flanking them, hitting them hard, catching them off guard, and without a doubt that is what Robert E. Lee hoped to do yet again here at Gettysburg. Uh, but here, this time, he would find an enemy that was far better prepared, better entrenched, and uh, Union forces also had the luxury of what was called interior lines, where General George Gordon Meade, commander of the Union Army of the Potomac, could uh, comparatively easier uh, transition troops from one spot to another uh, where they were needed most. And the Confederate lines, which framed the Union defenses but extended over double the length, they did not have that sort of flexibility. And furthermore, Robert E. Lee has 20,000 less troops at the Battle of Gettysburg as well. And so, ultimately, Distance and the time associated with it would be major pitfalls for these Confederate forces as they would strike Union positions on this day. Your division will be up over this unoccupied hill, the little rocky one. At this time of the day on July 2nd, Confederate leaders did not have a, quite a full comprehension of how far to the south Union lines had extended. And what Lee had initially hoped to do was to renew the attack or to push an attack onto Cemetery Hill via the Emmitsburg Road, moving from a south to north direction. Um, but once it became apparent that Union forces were extended down a little bit further, and after Union General Dan Sickles moves his Third Corps uh, out well ahead of the rest of the Union Army, those are going to become the key target, particularly of Longstreet's troops once we get into the afternoon of this day. I don't believe I've had the pleasure. That's Major General John Bell Hood, but we call him Sam. We have a rather uh, stereotypical interpretation here of uh, Colonel Fremantle, uh, red coat, cup of tea, uh, and everything else. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Fremantle was not wearing a uniform uh, as he was with the Confederate Army. Um, because once again, he was not here in an official capacity. Um, he was an observer of sorts, but a rather informal one. Um, and, and furthermore, uh, if he had been wearing a uniform, it would not have been red. Uh, but undoubtedly, uh, this was done so not as to confuse audience members. They didn't want to give him a, a blue uniform or a gray uniform, uh, you know, to, to get his allegiance mixed up among viewers or, or anything like that. Um, and so, you know, a little bit of uh, costuming liberty here done for the sake of clarity, and I suppose that's perfectly understandable. I earnestly hope that we shall become allies. Your government never ally itself with a confederacy that had the institution of slavery. You know that, so do I. 
By this point in the war, there was very little hope of the Confederacy being recognized by Great Britain or France because once Abraham Lincoln put forth the Emancipation Proclamation and making the destruction of slavery a war measure, um, there is no way that Great Britain or France, which had abolished slavery decades prior, were going to come aid to the aid of a confederacy that was trying to perpetuate that peculiar institution as it was known. We should have freed the slaves, then fired on Fort Sumter. Okay, we're going to pause this. Okay, time for another little rant. Um, this is completely ahistorical, <laughs> uh, this line. <laughs> um, it is certainly compelling and it, it offers a degree of sympathy toward General Longstreet and it kind of paints him as this outsider uh, who perhaps does not think as other Confederates do. Uh, but James Longstreet is from South Carolina. South Carolina was the first of the southern states to secede after the election of Abraham Lincoln. And once again, all we have to do is go to the primary source to get a sense of how and why these things are unfolding in the manner that they are. And we can read uh, a portion of these. These, these articles of secession are uh, readily available. And a portion of this document says, for 25 years, this agitation has been steadily increasing until it has now secured to its aid the power of the common government. Observing the forms of the Constitution, a sectional party has found within that article establishing the executive department, the means of subverting the Constitution itself. A geographical line has been drawn across the Union, and all the states north of that line have united in the election of a man to the high office of the President of the United States, whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. He is to be entrusted with the administration of the common government because he has declared that government cannot endure permanently half slave, half free, and that the public mind must rest in the belief that slavery is the course of ultimate extinction. These are the Articles of Secession from South Carolina, and as do all of the other Articles of Secession, it points out a villain in the form of Abraham Lincoln, and it fully explains why they thought he was the villain. Um, and so, for James Longstreet of South Carolina to be thinking this, um, it just simply did not happen. I mean, it just, slavery was not a peripheral issue, it was the issue. <laughs> I mean, we just gotta accept that. If, if you had Confederate ancestors, I mean, their actions are not a reflection on you unless you want them to be. Um, and so, you know, it, it's time that we as a society come to terms why the Civil War was fought and what it meant, because we're still dealing with the repercussions of it today. That's, that's ultimately one of the big lessons that, that the war presents us all these years later. Here in this scene, we see a chaplain of the Irish Brigade, Father William Corby, who is uh, depicted on my t-shirt here, um, giving the sign of the cross backwards um, to his uh, Catholic members of the Irish Brigade. And uh, this moment is uh, depicted in bronze on Cemetery Ridge. And uh, there is a twin copy of that statue. Uh, located on the Notre Dame campus at which Father Corby became president of uh, following the Civil War. To be a good commander, you must be willing to order the death of the thing you love. We do not fear our own death, you and I. This is a great line by Martin Sheen's character. Uh, you know, th this notion of ordering the death of the thing you love. Uh, is I think it's uh, it's it's universal um, to most generals of of most time periods, but uh, it was especially so for Robert E. Lee, who uh, of course uh, held his soldiers in great affection, and that sort of esteem was uh, reciprocated through throughout the the latter half of the war and throughout the remainder of his life. Colonel Chamberlain, Colonel Vincent, form your men. I want you to follow me and prepare to double quick. We're going to the top of that hill, right there, sir. Yes, 
Yes, sir. You hear that? Yes, sir. I get it, sir. There is a spur of the moment decision by Colonel Strong Vincent who uh, essentially received this SOS call from General Governor K. Warren, uh, who was at the top of Little Round Top, who realized that it was about to be attacked and uh, recognized that there were no federal troops up there. Uh, and so uh, Strong Vincent uh, bypassed the chain of command, uh, took his brigade up to the top of the hill, and ultimately they would arrive there about 10 or 15 minutes before the Confederates struck that hillside. If I attack as ordered, I'll lose half my division, and they'll still be looking down the throats at us from that rocky hill right there. General John Bell Hood uh, approached General Longstreet not once, but twice in protest uh, because you know he had observed that the, the federal lines had shifted, uh, that they were uh, stronger than uh, initially anticipated, uh, and he wanted to, indeed, as, as his character here would suggest, um, to move around to the right, uh, go out and search for the enemy's flank a little bit, uh, have a little bit more cover and concealment in doing so. And uh, James Longstreet was, was quite adamant and stern with him on the point. He said, you have your orders. General Lee has spoken. We must carry through with... Uh, the commands that have been issued to us. Um, and indeed, that's exactly what would happen. And here is the aforementioned General Warren, uh, General Meade's chief topographical engineer, um, who is one of the many saviors of Little Round Top. It's not merely Joshua Chamberlain, who is the big hero of this hillside. It's men like like Warren, like Chamberlain, like Strong Vincent, Patrick O'Rourke, and a slew of other men, many of whom did not survive, uh, who collectively uh, prevented the enemy from capturing this hill. Colonel, sir, you're the end of the line. Yes. You are the extreme left of the Union Army. The line runs all the way from here back to Cemetery Hill, but it ends here. For not being a career soldier, Strong Vincent did a magnificent job in placing his troops on Little Round Top, and uh, he placed his, uh, his four regiments going from uh, strongest to weakest because he had a good sense of where some of the, the main thrusts of the enemy attack would be emerging. And the 20th Maine uh, finds itself near a, a, a saddle that connects Little Round Top and Big Round Top on the, the southern edge of that uh, geographic formation. And uh, Vincent had a, a very good inclination um, that the Confederates would be trying to move up through that saddle between the hillsides uh, because the front of Little Round Top is largely open. Um, there, there's a lot of really large boulders and such, but uh, you can really see the enemy movement quite clearly, all things considered. Um, and so uh, Chamberlain and the 20th Maine uh, find themselves... Uh, right within the grasp of the enemy, and they arrived here not a moment too soon. Um, unlike what we see here in these moments of preparation, uh, Chamberlain's and, and his men, they really didn't have any time to prepare. Uh, they didn't have time to, you know, chop down trees or build up rocks or, or anything like that, as is, is seen in the film. Um, and this is something that Chamberlain wanted visitors to the park to be very much aware of in later years. But if you will look to our left, you will see that there is no one there. Because we're the end of the line. We cannot retreat. We cannot withdraw. We are going to have to be stubborn. It's interesting and important to note that at the other end of the Union line, on the far right, a very similar and equally stubborn and heroic defense uh, undertaken by the 137th New York by Colonel David Ireland took place. And Colonel Ireland does pretty much exactly the same thing on Culp's Hill that Joshua Chamberlain does on Little Round Top. Uh, you know, he refuses the line. Uh, his men involve themselves in, in a charge to uh, repulse the Confederates. But no one knows about David Ireland because he was never depicted in a famous novel or its movie adaptation. And so this really speaks to the power of Hollywood and demonstrates you know, how and why what we think is important about the historical past. And uh, the story 
of Joshua Chamberlain in the 20th Maine is a prime example of that. Um, in the 1960s or the 1970s, uh, most people wouldn't have been able to find the 20th Maine Monument if they had tried. Um, it was uh, overgrown, surrounded by brush, uh, wasn't in a very prominent place on Little Round Top, and today it's one of the few regimental monuments in the park that has its own paved walkway going to it, and it's because of this movie. People want to see where this took place. Will you put in a kind word for me? Yes, sir. Civil War soldiers were deeply religious, and on average, um, Americans in mid-19th century uh, were far more religious than, than what many Americans uh, are today. And as far as Union soldiers were concerned, you know, um, they believed in a judgmental God, a God who was on their side, uh, who was out to uh, help them protect and to preserve one of the few existing democracies uh, in that time. You've got to keep an eye on them, Colonel. Some of them, they load and load. They never fire. They just keep right on loading. Some of them come home with seven, eight bullets rammed up in the barrel. Never fired a shot. Uh, some post-battle evidence uh, suggests that this idea of, of uh, frightened soldiers who kept loading their rifles without firing it, uh, you know, true to an extent, um, the, the provost marshal, who was responsible for recovering a lot of the the debris uh, after the battle, uh, you know, sometimes found, uh, you know, rifles and muskets with, uh, you know, four, five, six, eight, ten, twelve uh, rounds uh, jammed in the barrel. Uh, and uh, so, you know, there, there is a degree of truth to this sort of uh, warning offered by Buster Kilrain. I had uh, two or three colleagues uh, from my days at the park who uh, served as extras uh, during these scenes on, uh, on Little Round Top. And uh, some of their memories <laughs> uh, recall just how dangerous it seemed on set. Um, because, uh, you know, these guys, you know, they're, uh, all of them are using real muskets for the most part. Very few of them had rubber bayonets. And uh, to, to the rec recollection of my colleagues, um, some of the reenactors were getting a little bit carried away um, in these scenes. You know, people were like actually getting clubbed and, you know, busting lips and uh, things like that. Um, and so uh, my friends actually uh, left uh, at midday uh, during uh, one day of filming because they did not want to become uh, the more recent casualties of the battle for a little round top. Wait a minute, I think they're moving out that way. Can you see them, sir? They're coming again, boys! They're coming again! In his memoirs and post-war writings, uh, you know, uh, Chamberlain at, at one point says, you know, that, you know, his, his men were, you know, outnumbered. I, I can't recall if he said five or ten to one. Um, which, which simply isn't true. Um, and Chamberlain's men were facing off with the troops of the 15th Alabama Infantry, who were commanded by Colonel William C. Oates. And uh, Oates had only slightly more men than the 20th Maine. And uh, considering that the Alabamians had to move uphill, and the Mainers were in a rather uh, stationary defensive position at the top of the hill. All things considered, they were really even um, at odds um, when you consider all of uh, the factors at play. Um, but all of that said, it was an up-close, personal, knock them down drag them out fight. And uh, if you ever have the opportunity, um, it's worthwhile to read not only Chamberlain's account, but also Oates's account as well. Uh, like Chamberlain, Oates had a brother fighting with him in the battle, and um, in fact, his brother dies. He's mortally wounded, and uh, Oates can see his brother bleeding out, shot multiple times, yards away, but he can't reach him. And um, so, 
you know, when you think about the command decisions that these men found themselves in, you know, somebody like Oates, he had to choose between the good and the love of his brother, who was on the verge of dying, and the well-being of his regimental family as a whole. And uh, ultimately, he has to do what he thinks is best not for his brother, but the unit which he commands. And that's a, a really powerful moment uh, when you think about it. Um, and, you know, we only kind of get a sense of that Confederate perspective here um, in this attack. Uh, but men on both sides, they were really in the thick of it. Yeah. When, uh, when viewers who haven't been to Gettysburg watch this scene, it may be a little bit confusing as to what exactly is being shown here and why it's being underscored by this really dramatic and wonderful soundtrack by Randy Edelman. Um, but when you go there in person and you go to the southern slopes of Little Round Top, it, it makes a lot more sense. And I think that's true of any battlefield. Um, if you really want to understand a place, you have to go walk the terrain yourself. Um, and when I worked there, um, you know, I had, I had this wonderful and honored privilege of being able to tell these stories to people from all over the world. And uh, hopefully, if I did my job well, um, I was able to make things click for people who perhaps saw the movie and wanted to learn more about the men who fought here. Uh, but in essence, what was going on, when you go to Little Round Top, you can see the 20th Maine Regimental Monument, and that roughly marked the position where their regimental tellers were located. And from the, the point of that monument, okay, the lines extended outward to the right flank and the left flank. And so they're, they're kind of in a V shape here on the southern edge of the hill. And they're positioned in such a way so the enemy cannot swing around and outflank them. Uh, the mini balls being fired out of these weapons were, were absolutely dreadful. They were 58 caliber hunks of lead. And when they hit bone and tissue, the, the round would pancake, it would flatten and it would, it would completely shatter any, any bone or, or muscle. And this is why there was such a high rate of amputation during the Civil War, because after a round, after a slug of that caliber hits you, um, there's no possible way that your arm will mend. And uh, it was impossible at that time for surgeons to thoroughly pluck out all, all the bits of, of shattered bone and God knows what else that had entered your body. And so really the only option that was available to Civil War surgeons was amputation. Um, but uh, contrary to popular myth, um, Civil War surgeons were not these medieval bone saw, you know, uh, butchers as they are often thought of. They were using the best medicine available to them at the time. And most surgeries, about 95% of them, were done with anesthetics. Soldiers were not biting the bullet, as the, the old saying would suggest. And um, most men had a, a high survival rate. Um, and so uh, this is a, a perception of the Civil War about doctors that should be corrected. If you want to learn more about that, it's a wonderful museum in Frederick, Maryland called the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. If you're ever in that neck of the state, check it out. I'll be damned. Chamberlain's uh, sword scabbard uh, was in fact struck. And uh, you can see this sword and scabbard today at the Joshua Chamberlain Museum in his hometown in Maine. Uh, Chamberlain was also struck in the foot by a piece of shrapnel, and in his, uh, in, uh, his boot, which uh, survives in that museum to this day, you can see where a, a patch of leather uh, was stitched over that part where uh, he was wounded. So some really fantastic artifacts um, from Chamberlain's time in the war exist, even though his uniform does not. We've been reinforced at the top of the hill by Weed Brigade up front. This is what they tell me. But Weed is dead. And so they moved Hazlitt's battery, that artillery up there. 
but has escaped. In this conversation with uh, the sergeant that Chamberlain is having here, it gets to one of the core reasons why Chamberlain is so well known, and that's because so many of his fellow colonels and officers died in defending Little Round Top, and he was one of the few people left to leave a historical record about it. Um, and so perhaps that was one of the contributing factors uh, that led Michael Shera to make him the protagonist in his book. And as a weird side note, from what I understand, uh, Randy Edelman, the composer, did this entire soundtrack on a synthesizer. Um, and it's rather incredible uh, when you think about it because it sounds like a legit orchestra uh, being used. And man, what a great soundtrack it is. I teach a whole class on the Battle of Gettysburg in history and memory. I've also taught classes on slavery and the Civil War in cinema. And uh, on occasion when I have shown, you know, select battle scenes from this movie in class, um, students are very receptive of it. Uh, they think that the film has stood the test of time uh, quite well. The battle scenes are uh, exciting. They are impressed by uh, the scale. And I think a lot like The Longest Day, which we have previously looked at, even though the film may not be very bloody or, you know, uh, you know shocking, you know, in those visceral sort of terms, um, you know, it, it just captures the magnitude with the number of people and extras that are used. And I think something like that is really valuable. <laughs> You know, I've often thought, as, as we've looked at some of these hand-to-hand -hand combat scenes, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if, if this movie came out today, if this movie would be rated PG-13 instead of PG. Um, you know, the, 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 the cultural norms of society, I suppose, uh, have changed ever so slightly. Or perhaps I, I'm completely wrong. <laughs> And I believe that Confederate officer that was just shot was uh, one of the, the, the prop masters um, in the film, and he got a little bit of screen time here. It's important to note that throughout the majority of this fight, Joshua Chamberlain did not have a sidearm. Uh, not until a moment slightly later on, which we will address, uh, did he have a pistol in his hand? And so for the almost the entirety of this fight, Chamberlain only has his sword in hand. Um, because, you know, in a lot of regards, um, during the Civil War, a colonel's responsibility was not to fight, but to lead, to oversee that his men were defending and acting and fighting in the manner that they should have been. Um, and so uh, Chamberlain having a pistol here and, you know, bravely fending off and, and shooting down Confederates at point-blank range, uh, this too did not happen. It has been added for dramatic emphasis. We can't run away. If we stay here, we can't shoot. So let's fix bayonets. These moments where Chamberlain is conversing with these officers and having like these little staff meetings, um, this, too, is something that would not happen in the heat of battle. There was no time or opportunity for, you know, like a dozen officers, lieutenants and captains and whatnot, um, to gather for these little conferences um, as Chamberlain is ruminating. Um, but for, you know, the purposes of explaining to the audience what is going on, I, I suppose it works in regard to carrying the narrative as such. But an iconic moment. Now, here's where we get into some of the fine details of what did and did not happen with this charge. Chamberlain did give the order to fix bayonets. Uh, but the idea that he choreographed or orchestrated this grand plan of swinging like a, a gate door down the hill, uh, it did not happen in the fashion that we see here. Uh, the charge of the 20th Maine was something far more spontaneous than what is depicted in this film. Once the order to fix bayonets was given, 
the men knew what was happening next. And according to Ellis Spear, one of the officers depicted in the film, his men saw the Kellers moving down the hill. He never heard the order to charge. And there's not really any strong evidence to suggest that Chamberlain gave the order to charge. But when you see the flag moving, you move with the regimental Kellers. And in order for Spears and his men to follow the flag that is at the point of that angle, they need to start moving down the hill in a fashion as such. And that is where this idea, this perception of the swinging door comes into motion, quite literally here. And even though it may not have been this, this grandly orchestrated moment, it's important to point out that it still worked. The charge was a success. It repelled the attack of the 15th Alabama. And Chamberlain and the 20th Maine did a hell of a job. They helped secure the far left of the Union lines, as did all of the other regiments and commanders on the hill. The pistol. The prisoner, sir. This showdown with a Confederate officer, whose name was Lieutenant Robert Wicker of the 15th Alabama, uh, this scene is taken almost verbatim from uh, Chamberlain's memoirs. Uh, the pistol carried by this Confederate lieutenant um, either misfired or it was out of ammunition. Chamberlain, as is depicted in the film, raises his sword up to Wicker's throat and he takes his pistol away from him. And that is the first time in the battle for Little Round Top that Chamberlain had a sidearm. And, uh, of course, by this point, he didn't really <laughs> need it or, or use it from this point forward on July 2nd. Lawrence, why you meet this fellow from Alabama? Captain Hawkins? Sir. May I have some water? Yes. This captain asking for water is a nice little detail incorporated here because the men of the 15th Alabama, the men of their brigade, they had made a forced march from Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, 25 miles since the night before. And as they were going into battle, um, a select number of their comrades were sent off to fill the men's canteens to replenish their water supply. And as it turns out, those men carrying the canteens were captured by federal troops. And so these men, these Alabamians, they had just marched 25 miles. It was a hot July day and they have no water. And so it's very appropriate here that this captured Confederate captain would be asking for water because these guys were probably on the brink of dehydration if they weren't there already. I've never served with a better man. Even though Buster Kilrain may be a fictional character, I think uh, the emotion conveyed in, in scenes like this is something that is very real and evocative, uh, speaking to the sorts of uh, bonds that, that men form in battle. And indeed, conversations uh, much like this were had amongst comrades as the smoke of battle cleared and as men began to assess who was still among the living and who was among the dead. Colonel, sir. You would so honor me. Although they show a bit of a comradeship here, uh, Chamberlain and Ellis Spear got into a little bit of a war of words over historical memory in, in the years following the conflict about what exactly happened on Little Round Top. Uh, you know, Chamberlain, you know, made the, these uh, claims, you know, about this charge and the swinging door and so forth. Ellis Spear making the argument uh, that it was something a little bit more spontaneous. I encourage all of you to go to the primary sources, go straight to the records, and do a deep dive. Separate fact from fiction, and you can see who you believe. Uh, name of this place is Hill. Has it got a name, this hill? This is Little Round Top. That's the name of the hill you defended. This hill actually did not have a name uh, during the battle. Um, General Meade referred to it as Yonder Hill. Um, in, in some 
accounts, it was known as uh, Sugarloaf Hill or, or Sugarloaf Mountain. Um, it's really not till after the Civil War that it becomes known as Little Round Top. This uh, part, uh, which concludes uh, the fighting on July 2nd in the film, um, it's, it's quite evocative. It suggests this pause in, in the fighting. Um, but in reality, the fight for the, the 20th Maine um, was not at all done um, because as uh, night came on, on uh, July 2nd, uh, the 20th Maine was ordered to the top of the neighboring hill, Big Round Top. And uh, for some of the men in the 20th Maine, moving to the top of that hill in pitch black darkness where every broken twig or rustle of leaves could have been Confederates lurking there in the dark. Um, it was a very scary moment uh, for these men. And uh, they very well could have become engaged in, in another fight at the top of uh, the neighboring hill of Big Round Top. And a lot of people don't realize it, um, but there is actually another 20th Main Monument located at the top of a big round top. It is uh, the lesser visited and the lesser known of the memorials uh, dedicated and honored of this fabled regiment. So if you ever have the chance to uh, hike the park, um, it's a very steep climb up to the top of big round top, uh, but it is uh, definitely worth the visit if you ever have the opportunity. And one of my uh, favorite stories uh, about that is uh, the Mainers are up on top of the hill at night they hear some rustling down below them, and a voice calls up. And the voice calls, who is that up there? And the Mainers reply back, no, who is it down there? And the voice replies, 15th Alabama. And uh, one smart soldier from Maine replies to that, so are we, come on up. And that is how a number of those Confederate soldiers are captured at night on Big Round Top. That concludes everything for this segment, examining Gettysburg on real history. We will continue to examine the rest of day two and also the action on July 3rd, 1863 in our next episode of real history. In the meantime, as I often do and as I failed to do in our previous episode, um, I have some book recommendations if you're interested in learning more on this subject matter. Um, if you would like to read the inspiration for this film, you of course cannot go wrong with Michael Scherer's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Killer Angels. I have my students read this in my Gettysburg class, and uh, for them it brings the story of the battle to life in a way that I think a lot of standard history books uh, cannot. And it, you can also get into these interesting conversations of separating fact from fiction when you incorporate books as such. If you are looking for a more intricate and detailed and comprehensive study of the Battle of Gettysburg, um, a really good one is Stephen Sears's humble tome simply called Gettysburg. Um, this is one of uh, several books that park rangers recommend to visitors uh, when they uh, come to the park and are looking for more information. And it does a very able job of illustrating not only the battle but the entirety of the campaign, the actions that bookended the three-day battle itself. And in regard to uh, the action shown in the film depicting July 2nd, 1863, um, there is a very fine book called Stand Firm Ye Boys from Maine by Thomas Desjardin. Um, and so this is a very fine little regimental history chronicling the fabled actions of the 20th Maine and likewise will further help you separate fact from fiction when you watch these uh, very iconic scenes in the movie Gettysburg. Uh, so, with that, now that you have your homework assignment, we hope that you join us again next time as we continue to analyze 1993's Gettysburg on Real History. Take care.
not in real life. I mean, he was a Catholic priest. He knew how to give the sign of the cross. The actor did not. The actor did not know how. Yeah. 